Thank you and good evening. Uh, special thanks to Dr. Procario Foley, uh, to Iona University, and to my colleagues at the Human Rights, the Holocaust and Human Rights Education Center, um, based in White Plains, with whom I've had the pleasure of collaborating on many projects over the years. Last week, as you know, marked the 84th anniversary of the nationwide pogrom in Nazi Germany, 1938, known as Kristallnacht. You see here in the first image a, a glimpse of the reason that the pogrom came to have that name, Kristallnacht, night of the glass, night of the broken glass, as we call it. <clears throat> because one of the features of that nationwide violence in Germany was the smashing of windows in Jewish businesses and Jewish homes. The statistics um, from that carnage tell us part of the story. The thousands of Jewish homes that were smashed, hundreds of synagogues burned to the ground, 30,000 German Jews hauled off to concentration camps, at least 91 German Jews murdered in that night-long hurricane of violence in November 1938. But of course, statistics only, um, only can give us a glimpse. And, and, and when, I, when, I, when I share with you those numbers, I'm reminded um, some years ago when I was teaching at Ohio State University, there was a, a woman in the, in the community, in the Jewish community in Columbus, who I invited to come and speak to my students on the anniversary of Kristallnacht because I had learned that she herself had been in Germany as a child on that terrible night. And she described to the students how as um, she and her family, she was I think eight years old at the time, and as she and her family heard the roaring of a mob coming down the street, they hid under the dining room table. And she described watching as the, um, the bar, the wooden bar, that, was, that kept the door closed, began to creak under the weight of the people outside, it's Nazi stormtroopers and, and, and other members of the mob banging and pushing on the door. And she saw the wood creaking and creaking, but it didn't quite give way. And for that reason, she and her family were spared. But of course, they were the exceptions that proved the rule that night. But you can only imagine the terror in the heart of a little girl hiding, cowering under a table as the door appears to be on the verge of, of, of bursting in. Now, Americans woke up the morning after Kristallnacht to read about it on the front pages of their newspapers. And sometimes this fact may seem a little surprising because, as many of you know, during the Holocaust itself, that is, during the period of the organized mass murder, the, the years of Auschwitz and, and Treblinka, the Germans and their collaborators made a great effort to hide what they were doing from the eyes of the outside world in the mistaken belief that if the international community knew what was happening, it would intervene. But that was later. Now, we're speaking this evening about 1938, before the onset of World War II, before the onset of the, of, of, of the Holocaust, of the mass murder period. <clears throat> and so at that point... What, what was happening to the Jews in Germany was quite well known and very well publicized. And although later, many major American newspapers would bury news of the Holocaust in their back pages, and in fact, the definitive study of American media coverage of that period is a book called Buried by the Times. It's a study of how the New York Times in particular covered the Holocaust. So although the news later was buried, in 1938, as you can see from these little excerpts, it was front page news. And, and not, just, not just the morning after, but actually it was a major news story in, in the American news media, the world news media, for uh, many days to follow. So there, were no, there was no secret as to what was happening. In my remarks this evening, I want to concentrate on how our president, Franklin D. Roosevelt, responded to the Holocaust, <clears throat> responded to... Kristallnacht in particular. We're going to begin by looking at a short excerpt from the first press conference that FDR held after the pogrom. Notice the date at the top, November 11, 1938. The violence in Germany was the night of November 9th and into the morning of November 10th. But by November 11th, 
You can see on the, these newspapers are dated Friday morning, November 11th. Later that morning, um, the president had a regular, regularly scheduled press conference um, at which he did not intend to say anything about what had just happened in Germany. We have uh, transcripts of every presidential press conference. And as you know, FDR was a superlative communicator. We all re know of his famous uh, fireside chats. He had frequent press conferences. Um, and in this uh, first press conference after Kristallnacht, um, you see at the top of the page, a reporter asked, Mr. President, have you anything to say about the Nazi government's expanded campaign against the Jews? <clears throat> Before we read the, uh, the president's response, let me just um, note the way any president conducts a press conference is, if the president wants to, wants to draw attention to a particular issue, he begins with a statement in the um, expectation that reporters will then ask about that particular issue that he's concerned about. So the very fact that FDR did not make any comment about it um, is our first indication that he was not really interested in talking about it. But a reporter brought it up. It's on page four, so it's a little ways into the press conference. And you see the president's response, no, I think not, Fred. You better handle that through the State Department. FDR did not want to speak about Kristallnacht. As we'll see, he ended up speaking about it, but his initial reaction was not to speak about it. We'll return to the question of why shortly. Over the course of the next several days, there was a tremendous outpouring of public um, anguish in the United States over what Americans were reading in the, their newspapers about what had happened in Germany. So there were many public statements by members of Congress, uh, other public figures, members of the clergy of all faiths. And this groundswell of criticism, much of which was reported in the news media, put a certain amount of pressure on the White House to do something. So whereas it appears from the president's first press conference that he was hoping to avoid having to discuss the pogrom, nonetheless, the pressure from the, from the ground up, this kind of grassroots pressure from public opinion, convinced the president and the State Department that it might be wise to say something after all. So the State Department drafted a statement, which the president made some edits to, as we'll see now, and then which he read aloud at a subsequent press conference. Here is a re reproduction of the actual statement that was drafted. So the type portion comes from the State Department. That's the initial draft. The little uh, markings, the handwriting, that's FDR's handwriting. It's the president's um, small changes. And then there's an additional statement at the bottom that he added in his own handwriting. The lower right-hand corner, you see the initial CH. That's Cordell Hull, the Secretary of State. So that's where the draft began. On any matter of foreign policy, that's how it works. Starts in the State Department, goes to the White House for the final decision and any changes. So here we read um, the president's statement, which, as I say, um, he read aloud at a press conference four days later. And he said, the news of the past few days from Germany has, I believe that's visibly, shocked public opinion in the United States. Such news from any part of the world would inevitably, be, inevitably produce a similar profound reaction among American people. With a view to gaining a first-hand picture of the situation in Germany, I ask the State Secretary of State <clears throat> to order our ambassador in Berlin to return at once for report and consultation. And then the president added, I myself could scarcely believe that such things could happen in a 20th century civilization. Now, as you look at that statement, I ask you, what is missing? And I would propose there are two things that are missing. Yes. Uh, the word Jews. So there are no Jews. The victims are not mentioned. Who else or what else is not mentioned? Condemnation. Killings. Let's return to condemnation in a minute. Killings is not specified, but I'm thinking of something else. Yes. So the vi there's no victims mentioned by name, and German. no right, no perp there's no perpetrator. Now isn't that isn't that striking? There's no mention of the German government, no mention of Hitler, no mention of who did this 
thing that the president could scarcely believe, and no mention of the victims. I'm going to explain why I think the, the, those omissions were deliberate. But in general, I emphasize this is a carefully crafted statement. It, w- when it, was, it was drafted by the Secretary of State, meaning his staff, and the Secretary of State approved it. Then it went to the White House. The president made changes. This wasn't just some slapdash comment that the president made off the cuff at a press conference. <clears throat> no perpetrators, no victims. And as you say, there's no, the word condemnation does not exactly appear here. It's a statement of shock and surprise mostly. I can't believe it. Uh, public opinion has been shocked. Uh, if this happened anywhere else in the world, it would produce a similar profound reaction. It's all a kind of a passive approach as opposed to, let's just say, directly saying the United States government condemns this horrible pogrom perpetrated by the government of Germany. That would be a simple declarative statement of fact. Yes. So that's true. So, so the comment is that the statement itself is kind of vague. There are no details about the violence. And as you mentioned, there's no reference to the killings. Not, at least 91 Jews were murdered. Um, but on that point, I would just note that it's not as if the, his, or the president's audience didn't know who he was talking about. So to give the president of the United States the benefit of the doubt here, as we saw, it was front page news. He wasn't, he could have argued that he didn't need, they, in, let's say in private consultation while drafting the statement, it's conceivable they could have said to themselves, the president's advisors, we don't really need to mention, to, to mention Hitler or the Jews because everyone will know. And, and that's true, everyone did know. But again, you don't leave out the victims and the perpetrators by accident. There's a very specific reason, and we'll, we'll return to that soon. Here's the press conference, a uh, transcript of the press conference on November 15th, <clears throat> four days after the previous com- press conference. And at this press conference, um, this is where the president read the statement. Um, and um, we, you see the bottom of the page where he's reading it out loud. The last, I want to draw your attention for a moment to the last point in the president's statement, which we saw back here about uh, recalling the ambassador. And you see it again at the, bo- the bottom of this page. With a view to gaining a firsthand picture of the current situation in Germany, I ask the Secretary of State to order our ambassador in Berlin to return at once for report and consultation. Um, that is not the same as recall- withdrawing an ambassador. It's not a recall of the ambassador. In, in, a, in the formal diplomatic sense, it was not a severing of diplomatic relations between America and Germany. It's not even a suspension of relations. There was no formal diplomatic protest by the Roosevelt administration to the German government over what had happened. The ambassador was, was, was returned for report and consultation. In other words, uh, the ambassador, Hugh Wilson, was ordered to come back to Washington to discuss the matter with the president. It happens that he did not return right away. Then World War II erupted the following year. And so Hugh Wilson, as it, as it turned out, never actually went back to Germany, but not as a matter of diplomatic protest. After reading that statement, um, as you see towards the top of the page, the president was asked, would you elaborate on that, sir? So here... The president was being sort of handed an opportunity to say anything further he might want to say, aside from the official statement. His response, no, I think it speaks for itself. The next question, what about the talk or rumors or report that, it is, that is called a recall? In other words, this is, is this a recall? Are we no, no longer going to have an ambassador in Berlin? And the president responded, technically speaking, in diplomatic parlance, it is not a recall. It's a summons to come home. Have you any estimate how long Ambassador Wilson will stay here? Nothing further than what the Secretary of State said today. Another question. Have you made any protests to Germany? And the president said, nothing has gone that I know of. Another question at the top of the page um, had to do with whether or not there's any place the Jews in Germany can go now that they're being... Um, driven out uh, 
and subjected to mass violence in order to drive them out of Germany. Mr. President, can you tell us whether you feel that there's any place in the world, any place in the world, where you could take care of mass emigration of the Jews from Germany? Have you given thought to that? He said, I've given a great deal of thought to it. Then he stopped. He, didn't, he wasn't intending to share whatever those thoughts were. Can you tell us any place particularly desirable? No, time is not ripe for that. Have there been any comments or protests made to, made to you concerning the destruction or damage of American property in Germany? So there were some American citizens in Germany. You know, there were American visitors. There were American businessmen. Obviously, there were American diplomats. Um, and there was some American property, all of which would have given the president pretext, so to speak, to take a greater interest in the issue. Um, but his response was, nothing has come through on that. He was asked again, you said nothing as yet on a possible protest of Germany. Is there anything on that? I cannot say anything on that. Would you recommend a relaxation of our immigration restrictions so the Jewish refugees could be received in this country? That is not in contemplation. We have the quota system. And America did have a quota system. Let's not imagine that President Roosevelt could simply have declared America's doors be flung open so all the Jews of Germany could come here. That was not the case. But that also does not mean there was nothing he could have done to provide haven for German Jewish refugees. What do I mean? Here you see, by the way, a line, a line of German Jews uh, outside of a, an American consulate in Germany hoping to apply for visas. So America had a quota system for immigration. It was based on national origins. This was a quota system that was not established by President Roosevelt. It preceded him. It was first enacted into law in 1921 and then tightened further in 1924. FDR inherited this restrictionist immigration system. But as I will explain, he took a bad system and he made it much worse. So the immigration law established quotas based on national origin, meaning, for example, there was a set number of German citizens who were allowed to come to the United States in any given year. It was a maximum. It was a cap. It was approximately 26,000. I say German citizens because it didn't, there was no quota specifically for people of one faith. But it happens that during that period, the vast majority of German citizens seeking to leave Germany, looking for a new place, looking for a haven, were in fact Jews. In 11 of President Roosevelt's 12 years in the White House, from 1933 to 1945, in 11 of those 12 years, the quota for immigrants from Germany was not filled. Not only was it not filled, in most of those years, it was three quarters or more unfilled. 75% or more of those available 26,000 places were not used. An unfilled quota place did not carry over into the next year. If it wasn't used, it was, in effect, thrown into the garbage. So when we speak of American immigration policy, of the Roosevelt administration's immigration policy in the 1930s, the key fact to remember is that even within the existing restrictive system, many more Jewish refugees could have come into the country. In fact, if we want to add them all up, all those unused quota places from Germany and then later from Germany, and also German-occupied countries from 1933 to 1945, there were over 190,000 unused quota places. So if at any point during this whole period, President Roosevelt had simply quietly instructed the State Department, which administered immigration policy, to just allow the quotas to be filled. Nearly 200,000 of Germany's 500 or so thousand Jews could have been saved. The reason the quotas were unfilled was because the, uh, the U.S. officials, consular officials, at American embassies and consulates in Germany, like the one we see here, scrutinized 
visa applicants in search of reasons to say no instead of looking for ways to say yes. They piled on all kinds of extra bureaucratic requirements, all kinds of administrative hindrances to make it as difficult as possible for, for applicants from Germany to have their visa, visa applications approved. I'll just give you a couple of quick examples of the kinds of, um, of ways in which immigration was blocked and suppressed below what the law allowed. Let's give you an example. It was a very famous Hollywood um, producer in those days, Carl, Carl Le Emily. Carl Le Emily's studios were famous for a um, number of the, the blockbuster horror pictures of, of the 30s, Frankensteins and others. Le Emily happened to him, himself have been a, a, an immigrant from Germany, although at an earlier period. In the late 1930s, he began trying to help bring over people from his hometown, relatives, friends, other kins, you know, people, people from the old neighborhood. In order to qualify for a, uh, a visa to the United States, you had to provide a guarantee. <clears throat> you had to have a written promise from an American citizen that he would financially take care of you in the event you, be, you became unemployed. This was in order to, um, to try to uh, forestall the possibility that immigrants would become dependent on government assistance. So Carl Emley served as a guarantor for a number of people. After he had signed for a number of these pledges, one day he received a letter from uh, the State Department telling him it would no longer accept his, his guarantees. Why? I mean, he was a very wealthy and famous uh, figure in Hollywood. There could hardly be a doubt that he would be able to fulfill his promises. But they said because he was 71, 71 years old, that he might not live long enough to fulfill those promises. And therefore, his guarantees would no longer be accepted. And by the way, here's, this is a good example of what I said before about looking for ways to say no instead of looking for ways to say yes. They could have had Lemley sign something saying his estate would take care of any refugee who became um, uh, impoverished for whom he had pledged. They could have, they could have done that. But no, the, instead, the approach was, no, that's it. We don't accept them anymore. And therefore, no, no one else from his hometown could any longer receive that guarantee. Through these kinds of approaches by the Roosevelt administration, immigration was kept very, very low. But that doesn't mean that there were no havens either in the United States or uh, in its territories. You're looking at a uh, photograph here of the very scenic U.S. Virgin Islands. Let me explain what the Virgin Islands have to do with Kristallnacht. So, to recap, <clears throat> we have a president and an administration that had decided not to make any formal diplomatic protest, not to draw too much attention to the Jewish victims or to the Hitlerite perpetrators, <clears throat> not to withdraw its ambassador to suspend or sever diplomatic relations with Germany, and not to do anything that would increase immigration to the United States, anything that would contravene the administration's ongoing policy of keeping immigration below even what the quota allowed. But it happened, not by coincidence, I'll explain. It happened that in late 1938 and into 1939, that was the one year that the German quota was filled. Remember I said earlier, it was not filled in 11 of 12 years. It happened that one year. Precisely because that was the year, mid-38 to mid-39, when the Jewish refugee crisis was hitting its peak and when there was the most pressure for visas. And the Roosevelt administration decided and it couldn't ask any other countries to help solve the Jewish refugee problem if it didn't at least allow its own quota to be filled. That one year, the president permitted the quota to be filled. So Jews fleeing after Kristallnacht, Jews trying to leave Germany after Kristallnacht, during, at that moment, could not enter the United States on regular, and, and, and through the regular channels. Those who applied and were even accepted were to put on a waiting list. So what does the Virgin Islands have to do with it? Well, it happens that shortly after Kristallnacht, the governor and the legislative assembly of the U.S. Virgin Islands publicly offered to open 
their territory to Jewish refugees. I keep calling it the U.S. Virgin Islands, by the way, just to, and just to be precise here. As you know, the Virgin Islands are divided in two. They're, they're two old colonial possessions. So there's a British Virgin Islands, and then a part of, the, of that territory is the U.S. Virgin Islands. And I'm only talking here about the U.S. Virgin Islands. But I want to return to the question of the British government by comparison in a moment. So the, this offer to open the doors of the Virgin Islands was made, as I say, in public. And um, six months later, when the infamous refugee ship, the St. Louis, with its 930 German Jewish passengers, approached the coast of Florida, hoping to be granted admission to the United States, urgent behind-the-scenes discussions were held between the State Department, the White House, and the Treasury Department about whether or not the U.S. government could do anything to help those refugees. And I say the Treasury Department because the Secretary of the Treasury, Henry Morgenthau Jr., who happened to have been the only Jewish member of the president's cabinet, raised the idea of letting these Jewish refugees on the ship to St. Louis, letting them land in the Virgin Islands. Because, and we have transcripts of Morgenthau's conversations with Secretary of State Hull, because, as he told Hull, the leaders of the Virgin Islands made this offer a few months ago. Why don't we take them up on it instead of allowing the ship this tragic ship to be hovering off, the, off of our coast. The Secretary of State went to the president, and then he called Morgenthau back, and we read in the transcript, he, just, he explains the problem. He says, Hull says, I discussed this with the president, and we decided that it can't be done. Now listen to the reason it couldn't be done. He said the only way to allow them into the Virgin Islands would be on visitor's visas or tourist visas. A tourist visa is six months long. It has that limit because our government naturally does not want a foreign tourist coming and then staying indefinitely or using a, a, a tourist visa as a, as a, um, as a, a device to, to immigrate to the country. So in order to do that, in order to qualify for that six-month visa, the law requires that you have a safe, permanent home to which you will return at the end of your six months of touring. The problem, Secretary Hull explained to Secretary Morgenthau, is that, well, these Jews don't have a safe, permanent home to return to. Well, look, they're fleeing from all this violence in Germany, um, so we can't be sure that, they will, that they're going to go back. Think about that catch-22. What Hull was saying is, they don't have a safe place to return to, therefore we're going to send them back to that very place. And indeed, as the ship, the St. Louis, began making its way back across the Atlantic, it did so um, with the, the president's assumption that it was going back to Germany. The end of the story is it did not go back to Germany. I'll return to that. But that was the expectation. Now, the president um, undertook one other gesture in response to Kristallnacht, not mentioned in that press conference. It came up in the next one. <clears throat> because, again, of this tremendous outpouring of public protests about the terrible violence in Germany, uh, and some criticism, by the way, in the news media and in Congress about the administration's weak response, the president, on the suggestion of his labor secretary, Francis Perkins, decided that he would offer one more gesture. He announced that he would extend the tourist visas of what he thought, what he said, were 12 to 15,000 German citizens who were then in the U.S. on these visas, and the visas were going to expire soon. He was not going to require them to immediately return to Germany. So that was the other gesture. As it turned out, the number 12 to 15,000 was considerably overstated. A few weeks later, the commissioner of immigration um, reported that actually it was about 5,000. So about 5,000 German citizens, not necessarily all Jews, some of them were German tourists, were not required to return immediately. And I, I'm bringing that number in in particular because I want to briefly compare America's response to Kristallnacht to that of the government of Great Britain. The British government and the French government did not issue statements condemning the Kristallnacht pogrom, which might seem remarkable in retrospect because uh, 
they didn't even condemn it, much less take any more significant steps. But they were afraid to even condemn it. But to be fair, they were very close. They were, they were in very close proximity to Nazi Germany. And Germany was clearly beginning to assume a war footing. So the, Ger- the British and the French were understandably worried about having any kind of a quarrel with Hitler. So they didn't, they didn't issue any kind of a statement. President Roosevelt's statement, for all of its flaws, or let's say all of its shortcomings, um, was actually the only such statement made by a world leader. But here's the important difference between the British response and the American government's response. The British agreed to what have now become the well-known uh, kinder transports. 10,000 German Jewish children were sent to Great Britain and saved. Not only that, but in addition, this is not well known, the British government also agreed to take in 15,000 young German Jewish women, ostensibly as housekeepers and nannies, but obviously there wasn't a sudden shortage of housekeepers and nannies. This was a way to save their lives. So the British government, interestingly, opened its doors to 25,000 young German Jews. And in that sense, um, the British response to Kristallnacht was considerably more generous than that of our own government. I want to conclude by looking at the broader context of this subject, the question of how our country responds when innocent people are persecuted around the world. Because as we know, the Holocaust was not the last genocide. Every generation of Americans since then has at one point or another grappled with this question of to what extent should our country use its resources to try to help persecuted people in other countries? Should we be the policemen of the world, the phrase we often hear, or is it none of our business? Should we just care about America first, as some people say? When we've seen different responses. We've seen a variety of responses to post-Holocaust genocides. In the case of Cambodia, the case of Rwanda, there was no American response to speak of. In the case of Darfur as well, the American response was, I would say, meager. Notice I'm referring to genocides that took place under different, different administrations, Republicans, Democrats. There's no clear line here. It has varied from president to president, from party to party. Attitudes have shifted back and forth. More recently, um, we have seen a more, um, a greater interest in intervening. Let's cite, for example, the case of the Balkans, the ethnic, ethnic cleansing in the Balkans, where it was late, but the Clinton administration did use military force together with our allies to put an end to those atrocities. The case of the Yazidis who were besieged uh, by ISIS and, um, and went, in response to which President Obama used American military uh, air power to end that siege and to save several thousand uh, persecuted Yazidis. You'll recall as well the United States uh, also during the Obama administration, uh, used force in Libya when it appeared that um, the dictator Gaddafi was about to unleash uh, massacres of civilians. During the Trump administration, there were limited airstrikes on Syrian uh, chemical weapons factories. Still, in each of these cases, there was no clear policy. There's no clear decision that America has an ongoing obligation. My own feeling is that we do have a moral obligation, not to be the policeman of the world, not necessarily to intervene in every, in every human rights tragedy around the world. But I, I do believe that the majority of the American public would support in specific circumstances, as with the Yazidis or the Syrian chemical weapons factories, support some use of America's a military power to try to rescue uh, the persecuted or to interrupt 
persecution. The kind of military actions that were not taken during the Roosevelt years when, for example, the railway lines leading to Auschwitz could have been bombed and yet were not. With that, um, I will be very glad to take any questions. My name is Mel Leitner and um, I'm a gallery educator at the Museum of Jewish Heritage down in Battery Park. And uh, another of my friends who's sitting in the row be in front of me, he too is at the museum. About 10 years ago, there was an exhibit, one country in the entire world offered to take 100,000 German Jews into uh, that country. That was the Dominican Republic ruled by uh, Rafael Trujillo. Of the 100,000, only 5,000 elected volunteered to go. Why? They heard that there were jungles and wild animals. But when those 5,000 that went there, they were doctors, lawyers, teachers. They set up clinics. And they, in turn, not only for, the, for their own um, colleagues, the clinics were set up for the natives. The schools were educating not only the German Jewish children, but also the, um, also the, uh, the natives. But an interesting thing, we won't go through it any longer. I just one more thing. Roosevelt's, I'm not, I'm not uh, you know, taking his side, but number one, um, it was a depression, a worldwide depression. The majority of the people, he was a fantastic politician. There was, the people said, Who's, we don't have enough food for our own, let alone for people from another country. But my question is, um, why wouldn't other countries in the world offer to take in South America, Central America? It was a worldwide depression, but I'll turn it over to someone else. So um, a few comments on, on your, um, your interesting remarks, and thank you for sharing those points. Let's begin with the depression. Of course, it's crucially important in any discussion of a topic like this to keep in mind the broader context. America was undergoing the, the terrible strains of, of a Great Depression. Uh, unemployment at the peak of the Depression hit 25 percent. Um, the American, American public was, was suffering. And that's why it would not have been uh, realistic for President Roosevelt to, for example, go to Congress and ask for a, an overhaul or a liberalizing of the immigration quotas. There was strong opposition, both among the public and within Congress, to the idea of liberalizing the quotas. And that's why I emphasized the issue of the unfilled quotas. Because while it would not have been possible for the president to change the immigration system, it would have been com completely possible to act within the existing immigration quotas. The president would not have needed to fight with Congress to do anything unpopular, to do anything politically risky, to start any public controversy if he simply wanted the unfilled existing quotas to be used. All he had to do was tell the State Department, act within the existing law. I think it's very important to, um, to focus on this because when we, when we look at a, a president, especially a great and revered, justly revered president like FDR, we don't want to engage in Monday morning quarterbacking and say, oh, we should have done this or we should have done that. We want to look at what were the realistic um, circumstances of that time. And that's why I focus on the existing quotas, what could have been done. I would never imagine the president could have simply issued an executive order throwing open America's doors to refugees. No. The depression, isolationism, anti-immigration sentiment were all very strong. That's why we talk about um, the unfilled quotas, opportunities like the Virgin Islands, things that could have been done without starting a major public controversy that could have endangered the president's re-election. That was the first part of your question. The second part of your question is why, why didn't other countries um, want to take in Jews? Well, the same, the same mixture of sentiment here, really, that we're talking about with with President Roosevelt, um, that same con con witch's brew of, of anti-Semitism 
of genuine economic stress. Ask yourself, why did Cuba turn this turn away the refugee ship to St. Louis before it came to America's coast? The St. Louis first first dropped anchor in the harbor at Havana. The the passengers on board had papers that they believed would allow them to disembark in Cuba. But the Cuban government responding to its own domestic pressure, anti-immigration sentiment, anti-Semitism, turned them away. So sadly, those kinds of attitudes um, were prevalent everywhere. But anti-Semitism in America did not, was not what prevented President Roosevelt from allowing more Jews to enter the country. And the fact that there was a lot of anti-Semitism, and there was, historians calculate that there were over 100 anti-Semitic organizations active in the U.S. during the 1930s. Um, most scholars will tell you that that was the, the peak period in American history for anti-Semitism. But anti-Semitism did not stop the president from allowing the unfilled quotas to be used. Anti-Semitism did not stop him from allowing, for example, the Virgin, the Virgin Islands to, to take in the Jews that they offered to take in. So it's important to separate the two and not, not imagine that anti-Semitism is some kind of a, a justification for, for the president suppressing immigration far below what the law already allowed. Hi, um, my name is Tiffany. I'm, I'm actually an English major, but um, I'm taking a social work class. Um, I was just curious, it might be a dumb question, but like it's more of a history question, I guess. Um, the ambassador that like he called back, I guess, did he have the power to like have the ambassador stay there and like kind of be like a peacemaker there? Or did he call him back? Like, at a, like what was the story with that? Like, did he ever follow up? Like, did he do anything impactful or did he just like run home and do nothing? There was no possibility of him being um, a peacemaker, as you say, because the Hitler regime, the Hitler government had decided on a policy of violent anti-Semitism um, and aimed at driving the Jews out of Germany. And there was, there was nothing that he could have done himself. However, however, um, every government in the world is sensitive at some point and on some level to how other governments interact with it. Because every, every country in the world has to trade with other countries. Um, and every country, uh, th and, you know, some leaders are, are less sensitive than others, but there are always pressure points. So for example, had the Roosevelt administration imposed some kind of uh, trade sanctions on Nazi Germany, it's conceivable that could have had some effect on Germany's policy toward the Jews. I mention that because the consistent policy of the Roosevelt administration from 1933 until America entered World War II in 1941 was to have friendly trade and diplomatic relations with Nazi Germany. When we saw the statement that FDR made after Kristallnacht, that was the first time since FDR became president, that he had publicly mentioned the Jews in Germany. He had given literally hundreds of press conferences between 1933 and 1938, and he never once expressed any disapproval, or concern about the intensifying persecution of Jews in Germany. So the policy of the administration was to maintain friendly relations with Hitler in the 30s, to refrain from any kind of conflict, to maintain normal trade relations, and America, continue to trade with Nazi Germany throughout this entire period. So first of all, your book, uh, The Jews Should Be Quiet, was fantastic. Second of all, um, I saw that obviously neither you nor either neither you nor Laura Leff, the author of The Great Buried by the Times, was on Ken Burns and Lynn Novak Nozick's uh, recent Holocaust documentary. Uh, did they contact you and uh, Ms. Left as far as you know about Ms. Left? And, because uh, it would have been nice to get somewhat of a more contradictory views, especially on the immigration status and also on the on the bombing of the camps and the railroads. And if you can talk very just very briefly about, because the in, presented in the, in Ken Burns' special obviously was that the bombing of the railroads and the camps would have been uh, impossible and ineffectual. So if you can comment on that, I'd appreciate it. Great filmmakers are not always great historians, unfortunately. Um, and for those of you who watched the Ken Burns film, The U.S. and the Holocaust, I'm sure um, found it moving, poignant in some respects. It's a powerful film like every one of Ken Burns' films. 
But um, as a historian, I must note that it had major shortcomings. This issue of the unfilled quotas, which I've been emphasizing this evening, was literally not even mentioned in the entire six plus hours of the Ken Burns series. There was a lot of talk about immigration. There was talk about America restricting immigration. But it was never mentioned that every single year, most of the quota places from Germany were not even used. As for the, the issue of the failure to bomb the railways and bridges leading to Auschwitz, um, you are correct that the film presented it as if that was somehow not feasible, Mil that from a military point of view, it couldn't have been done. Well, that's a myth that was exploded decades ago. Watching this film for me was almost like, it felt like a throwback to the 1950s and 60s when historians of the period all wrote about FDR's response to the Holocaust in glowing terms. And all of his biographers treated him as if he had a halo over his head and found, found themselves un incapable of judging him as they judge any other president to look at, what, at, the, at, at all the different um, aspects and angles and you know, the good and the bad. In the Ken Burns film, it, it was portrayed as if America could not have bombed those railways. Um, and yet we know, and it's been known for many decades now, that um, American planes, American bombers, actually struck in Auschwitz, not in the part of Auschwitz where the mass murder was taking place. Auschwitz was a huge complex, range over a number of miles. There was the mass murder area known as Birkenau, and there was a slave labor area where, incidentally, young Elie Wiesel was a teenage prisoner. And in that um, slave labor area, the Germans had set up synthetic oil factories. American bombers hit those synthetic oil factories again and again. They were less than five miles from the gas chambers, also extremely close to the railway lines leading into Auschwitz, over which hundreds of thousands of Jews were deported in cattle cars from all over Europe. Yes, the railways and the bridges to Auschwitz could have been bombed um, at minimal risk. Um, and again, I'm not saying this um, in any sense of Monday morning quarterbacking. I'm referring to the fact that America conducted a massive air war striking railways and bridges throughout Europe during 1944. A number of years ago, uh, my colleagues and I learned that uh, George McGovern, who in, the, in 1972 was the Democratic presidential nominee and who was a U.S. senator for many years, that McGovern had been one of those young pilots in World War II who had flown those missions bombing those oil factories in Auschwitz. So we sent a camera crew out to South Dakota. Unfortunately, it was the middle of winter, but, you know, um, to interview him to do an oral, like an oral history, the kind of oral history interviews that are done with Holocaust survivors. We did an oral history uh, interview with McGovern about that experience. And by the way, you can see the interview on the website of my institute, wymaninstitute.org, W-Y-M-A-N institute.org. You can see the M McGovern interview. And McGovern speaks about the fact that he was often sent on missions to bomb railways and bridges. And he said, that, of course, they're hard to hit, but sometimes you had to, they had, he had to you know, fly over a target a few times, but they hit them again and again. Why? Because railways and bridges were, were an important um, avenue for an important, uh, important uh, military target. Obviously, the Germans used them for transporting troops and, and war material. Um, McGovern said that um, it's well known that, that railways could be repaired, sometimes relatively quickly. This was brought up in the Burns film as if, well, there's no point, there would be no point in bombing those railways because they could have repaired them. Well, first of all, the United States bombed, our Air Force bombed um, many railways throughout Europe, even though the Germans um, sometimes were able to repair them quickly. But bridges, but bridges um, often could not be repaired quickly or at all. Many of the requests made by Jewish organizations in 1944 to the Roosevelt administration to bomb Auschwitz or the railways or the bridges specified the names of railway junctions and bridges, the specific targets that they knew if those bridges were taken out, 
It would have severely disrupted the deportation process. Now, of course, nobody had any way of knowing at the time how long the war would go on. There was no way of knowing if it would end in a week or a month or a year. But Auschwitz, at its peak, in the summer of 1944, at Auschwitz, 12,000 Jews were being gassed every single day. So knocking out a bridge and stopping trains from coming, even for a, a day or a few days, could have saved many lives. So it was a serious a flaw in the Burns film to give the impression that it couldn't be done um, because they were, they were, as McGovern told us, they were bombing targets like that all the time. Um, and they were even bombing within a few miles of the gas chambers. Well, a few miles of the gas chambers means a few minutes flying time for those bombers. So if it wasn't anti-Semitism, then why didn't FDR fill the quotas, according to your opinion? Why, why not fill the quotas? Why not? If, as I say, you, that you, there would have been no public controversy, you could have let people in. Um, they had financial guarantees. These were people applying for visas through the normal channels. So why not let them in? Why go above and beyond? Why go beyond the law in order to keep down the number of Jews? By the same token, you could say, why not use a few of those planes that were flying near Auschwitz? Why not? They were already there. Wouldn't have diverted from the war effort. Why not? And I'll add a third question along the same lines. When American Jewish organizations during the 1940s asked the Roosevelt administration to do something to allow more, more Jewish refugees to come to America, often they were told there are no ships available. No shipping available. In fact and this was known at the time, American troop supply ships, which were known as Liberty ships, which brought American soldiers and weapons to Europe, <clears throat> returned from Europe empty. Now, because they were empty, they had to be loaded down with something to keep them from capsizing. So here's what they would do. They would load up, after, after the troops and the, and, the, and the weapons were unloaded, then they would load the ships up with rubble from bombed out British cities that had been hit you know, in the German Blitz. The city of Bristol in particular um, contributed a lot of rubble from their buildings to keep these, Amer these empty American ships from capsizing. So the question I ask, and again, not just as an after, you know, with the hindsight of, of time, but a question that was asked by some Jewish groups in 1943 if you're weighing it down with a rubble, why couldn't you just weigh it down with Jewish refugees? And there's a little ironic footnote to this that I have to mention. So these ships loaded with the rubble from Bristol um, would typically come to the port of southern New York, and they would dump all of this, this concrete, these concrete chunks in the water there, right off the edge of Manhattan. Um, and it was so much of this was happening that at a certain point, the mayor... LaGuardia, decided it would be appropriate to honor, um, to honor the people of Bristol. If you go down to the very eastern edge of 20th, 26th Street, 25th, 26th Street, you'll see a plaque because it was a ceremony held in 1943 to name that little area um, after the city of Bristol. A lot of the rubble is there in the water, I don't know if you can see it by looking down, but it's there. But there was so much rubble that they didn't use it all in the water. They used some of it at, to, help, um, to help build a major highway that was just then under construction along the east side of Manhattan. That uh, highway, of course, is ironically the FDR Drive. So the ships that could have brought Jews but were prevented by that president brought the rubble that was used to build the highway that commemorates him. But I didn't answer your question yet. I've given you three graphic examples of how the Roosevelt administration went beyond. So the question is why? This is a question that bedeviled historians for many years. In many of the early um, and important studies of America and the Holocaust, this question of why is not really addressed. I'm talking about uh, a number of the, the books in the late 1960s and, 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 and the 1970s. There are very important scholarly studies of this, but they don't exactly, they don't quite 
answer the question. Um, and for many years, I, um, I also wondered, ultimately, what, how do you explain this? And a few years ago, I believe I, um, I was finally able to shed some light on at least part of the reason. But it came about through unusual circumstance. There was a book published um, about FDR's order to intern Japanese Americans. As you know, in 1942, the president um, authorized the mass arrest and incarceration of more than 130,000 innocent Japanese Americans on the false suspicion that they might turn out to be spies. Not a single case of any of them ever spying for Japan, by the way, had been uncovered or was ever uncovered. This book um, by an American professor in Canada named Greg Robinson, the book is called By Order of the President. They grappled with this question. Franklin Roosevelt was a man of, of liberal sentiment, and he was known as a champion of the little people. He, he had a famous, uh, what we would say, called a soundbite in the 1932 campaign. He was the champion of the forgotten man. And in many ways, he really was. So the question that Professor Robinson posed in his book is, how could somebody who was in general liberal and progressive-minded do something so racist and unjust as order the mass roundup of 130,000 people literally because of the color of their skin and their, and their you know, national, their, national uh, their ethnicity. He began looking back through FDR's pre-presidential years. It was a period, you know, before FDR was president, he was the governor of New York. Between the time of becoming governor of New York Let's go back a little bit. 1920, he was the Democratic vice presidential nominee. 1928, he was elected governor of New York. There's an eight-year period there. That's the eight years when he was afflicted with polio. As part of his treatment for polio, he spent a lot of time in Georgia, at Hot Springs in Georgia. During that time, and this was kind of generally forgotten until Professor Robinson uncovered it. During that time, um, Roosevelt wrote a number of articles for the local Georgia press. He actually had a column in the Macon, Georgia Daily Telegraph. And he wrote some articles for other magazines. And one of the hot topics of the day was uh, Japanese immigration, whether or not Jap Japanese citizens should be allowed to come to America. And Roosevelt took an active part in that public debate in a series of articles for that newspaper and the magazines. And there he expressed... Um, what can only be described as brutally racist attitudes towards Asians. He referred to them as Orientals. That was the common term. He talked about how Orientals and, and Caucasians should not be allowed to intermarry. He talked about how um, allowing Orientals into America would harm um, America's white heritage and how there should be restrictions on their immigration, on their ability to own property, and so forth. Now, he wasn't writing this when he was a teenager or a college student or even a young man. He had already been a nominee to be vice president, and he was, was about to run for governor of New York. <clears throat> the common thread in his articles about Asians was that there was something in their blood that made them inherently untrustworthy, that there was something that, 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 um, that made it impossible to feel that they would always be loyal to America. Something innate, innate about them. As I was reading this, I was suddenly struck by the similarity between those comments about Asians and a number of comments that I knew from my research that Roosevelt had privately made about Jews. Over the course of the last decade, I and a number of other scholars have uncovered additional comments, which I'm about to describe to you, about Jews that President Roosevelt made, mostly while he was president, a few before, um, in private, never expecting it to be made in public. These were comments that were made to friendly parties, not somebody who was a, was a political enemy and therefore might be trying to embarrass the president by leaking it or something. No, these are comments that were made by his political allies, sometimes written in diaries, private diaries, never intended for publication. But again and again, in his comments about Jews, when I say again and again, I mean there are about 15 well-documented such comments. Again and again, it's the same theme. 
there's something about the Jews which makes them untrustworthy. They will try to dominate the culture or the economy. In one of the comments, he boasts. He boasts about how when he was on the board at Harvard, the board of directors at Harvard, he helped impose a quota to restrict the number of Jewish students entering Harvard because you can't have too many of them on campus. They'll try to take it over. There's a comment in which he talks about how the only reason that there's anti-Semitism in Poland, this is 1938, is because the Polish Jews are trying to control the economy in Poland. There's a comment where he complains about there being too many um, Jews among federal employees on the West Coast. Again and again, it's the same kind of theme. There's one point in which Roosevelt remarks in 1943 privately to Churchill, they're talking about what to do with the Jews after the war. And FDR says, I think they need to be spread thin all over the world. Don't allow more than four or five families in any one place because then they'll try to take it over. A year later, a year later, the president gave a press conference at which he was discussing what's going to happen to the Japanese when they're let out of these detention camps because the war was drawing to a close. Reporters were asking him, what do you, what's going to happen to them when they're let out? And he says in the press conference, well, I think they need to be spread thin all over the country. We shouldn't allow more than four or five families in any given city because otherwise those Japanese those Orientals. They're cunning and they'll try to take over. The wording is almost exactly what he was thinking with regard to Jews. And so my conclusion from studying these comments is that President Roosevelt, sadly, for all of his great qualities and as many of his incredible accomplishments leading America out of the Depression, leading America in World War II, for all of that, he had a vision of America's future which was of a country that would be overwhelmingly white, Anglo-Saxon, and Protestant. There would not be too many Jews. And that partially, partially, there are a number of factors, but that partially explains why his policy towards immigration was exactly that, to ensure that there would not be too many foreign Jews come into the United States. Thank you for that information. I didn't know a lot of it. But what, I, what I'm questioning is, I, I, there's no doubt he was like that. Yet, he was very close to Morgenthau. Yet, he manipulated Rabbi Stephen Weiss, who was one of the you know, greatest Jewish leaders at the time. Strange attitude. Let, let me take it a little further. The president had Jewish speechwriters and Jewish advisors. He had a circle. A Harvard brain trust. Yeah, yeah, yeah a circle of inner advisors. Some of whom were Jews. Right. So yes. it's, it's very, in addition to the Secretary of the Treasury. Yeah, he's sort of like schizophrenic. <laughs> well, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that. I would say a certain kind of Jew could, in theory, rise to that level within the Roosevelt administration. It had to be a Jew who was willing to never talk about Jewish concerns to the president. But was Stephen Weiss like that? Stephen Wise, Rabbi Stephen Wise, who was the foremost American Jewish leader of that era, he was not part of FDR's inner circle. He was, but, we're, I'm, I'm speaking about people like Justice Felix, Felix Frankfurter, um, his, uh, his chief speechwriter, Sam Rosenman, his chief New Deal architect, uh, Ben Cohen. Um, you mentioned Morgenthau. Morgenthau was the only Jew in the cabinet. Morgenthau, up until extremely late in this whole period, never once spoke to the president about Jewish issues. These gentlemen understood that if they began raising Jewish concerns to the president, that he would resent it. And so that was the price they paid. So the only thing that Morgenthau did was at the end of the war, he didn't want a Marshall Plan for Germany. He wanted the Germans to No, be... I'm, No, I'm referring to something else. But before I do, let me just, let me just add this. So... There are obviously different kinds of anti-Semitism and different kinds of anti-Semites. Uh, we, use a, we, you know, we use the term broadly, anti-Semitism, but there are different types. And there are, people, there, are, there are people who harbor prejudices against Jews in general, and yet on a, on, a, on a small individual level can cooperate with them, or in the president's case, he found them very useful as speechwriters, as advisors, as architects of, of many of his important domestic policies. So um, Morgenthau was very helpful to the president. Um, and so the president had no... Now, the president never socialized with the Morgenthau. So let me just add this because it's relevant. So Henry Morgenthau um, was a neighbor of the Roosevelt's in Hyde Park. He was a neighbor. 
He knew the president personally. But in, um, in the memoirs of his children, they describe how they were never allowed to socialize with the Roosevelts. Roosevelt's would not allow them to, to take part in, in any social occasions. That was where they drew the line. So when we speak of, of, of Roosevelt having some anti-Semitic sentiments, so it, it, it was reflected in some of his policies. It didn't necessarily ha mean that he would never associate with any Jews. I would not call it schizophrenic. I would call it a certain type um, of bigotry. Or, you, or, use the, or use the expertise of Jews that he could use. Yes, that's right. I get it. It disturbed me why the Jews never had the feeling that they have to leave Germany. I'm not talking about the Kristallnacht, but immediately after the Kristallnacht, when they start segregating the Jews or taking them out of employment, whether it's hospitals or any, any things of intellectual uh, that they were in the uh, German society. They never sense that it, it's time to move on. It, they, they wait uh, till the very last minute, like the bulk is 1938, is when, when we see the uh, lines for visas, not only for the United States, but other countries, it was late. And I think, I think the reason for that is that the persecution of the Jews in Nazi Germany it didn't happen all at once. It didn't suddenly descend on the night of Kristallnacht. Um, discrimination against Jews uh, under the Hitler regime began as soon as Hitler rose to power in early 1933, but it was still a very gradual process. They were pushed out of many occupations in 1933. Um, but they weren't yet subjected to violence. And as the years continued into the mid-30s and into the late 30s, many German Jews still convinced themselves either Hitler would soon fall from power, or yes, this is bad, but it's not going to get any worse, or we've been forced out of some jobs, but we can find, we can find other jobs. They did not necessarily imagine that something like Kristallnacht could have happened. It was as much a shock to Germ Jews in Germany as it was to, G to everyone around the world, precisely because Germany had for so long been the world center of science and culture and civilization. It was, it was, if, if you could have predicted, if you could have tried to predict a country where there would be a mass murder of Jews before Hitler's rise to power, you wouldn't have said Germany. You would have probably predicted a country where um, where it had a, a, you know, more of a tradition of crude anti-Semitism. I don't know, Poland, for example, um, or some other East European country. It was Germany was, the fact that it happened in Germany of all places was such a shock. That's, part of, that's a, a major part of the reason it took many German Jews so long to realize that their situation was hopeless. And then by the time they realized it, for many it was too late because by then so many of the doors around the world had closed. So, first of all, thank you for coming. It's great to be back in person. And yes, thank Dr. Madoff, please. So thank you, thank you. Be careful going home.